Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This week we're going to look at what myself and Richie worked on last year and they're going to continue to work on this year. Uh, what we think are the areas that are going to add value to our own competitors and how we're going to shape and design our training to try and get improvements in those areas. So join us on this uh, bit of a sit down and talk and an exploration. Hopefully you'll get something out of it too. Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of 2023, episode 121. So we're going to have a look at some of the main things that we've taken from all these episodes we've done last year and even before that as well. And some things that we see consistently that come up time and time again that get great value in ITF sparring to be able to put yourself to the forefront, get the scores on the board, not concede so much and put yourself in a great position to win in competitive ITF sparring. So... The motivation for this question actually came in in one of the comments on one of our recent videos. So Adam Green sent in a great suggestion. Okay, so understanding content and analysis, we would love to see how you then take some of the skills and principles you've picked up and teach them to your students and athletes. So basically, that's what we're going to cover today. We're going to have a look at some ideas that we have from Fight Chat Friday episodes, some clips that we have looked at with some good principles of solid itf sparring skills and then what we would do and what we have done and what we aim to do in the future to bring those skills from the video and the analysis into training and then into performance eventually yeah absolutely and for me i always kind of look at it as okay where were the challenges it's like doing your swot analysis at the start of the year you know what were the strengths of my athletes and my competitors as i looked at it from last year's performances um, where were the weaknesses? Were there things that they were vulnerable to? Are there opportunities? So things that are emerging in the environment that they're going to be able to use to their advantage over time. And are there threats? You know, are, are certain techniques or strategies coming to the fore that are actually going to pose a problem? Or even certain competitors, so let's say somebody has moved from junior to senior or moved from you know 56 to 62, whatever the, the weight category happens to be. And so we'll have a look at that. And yeah. definitely for me, one of the things that we ran into over the last number of years was um, you need an answer to a good blitz. So if someone is going to be fast off the hands and direct and you don't have an answer to that, you don't get to implement your game at all. So it's a little bit like someone having a flashy front leg. Um, if you can't interact with a person's front leg, you don't get your game. And in this same sense, if you don't have an answer uh, to someone who's got solid hands uh, and particular solid blitz, you don't get to get into your game. So this was just uh, one clip we picked out just to highlight a solid defense and a solid answer uh, to that. And, you know, in, in a similar one with Jamie there in the slip hook, we just, for me, you've got two kind of options in terms of what, where you want to go. Are we going to try and train to keep the distance a little bit bigger and defend off of the legs? Or are we going to allow the distance to be a little bit closer and try to react with the hands and a body defense? And, uh, you know, for me and with my guys, I kind of focused in the last while, while still cross training and doing a little bit of everything, uh, the body defense and the use of the hands was kind of where we put our time and effort. Yeah, and we, there's many solutions to this problem. We've done, we've done a video on this with, I think, five or six different solutions you can have. Yeah. But again, it's about taking these solutions and then putting them into practice and being able to train them and to be able to come up with them based on the the problems that you see in the live um, sparring constraints. You know, so that one of the one of the best things about this as well is when we look at these big problems, we want to take things that are, you know, we we look at that Pareto principle. You want the, the big majority of problems and solutions that come up in ITF sparring. You don't want to do something that might happen. 2% of matches, you want the big actions and the big decisions that come up time and time again. So you're going to get more value for your training time. So this is definitely one of those, all sparring matches are going to have an interaction between hands and hands or yeah. hands and legs with somebody attacking and putting some pressure on with the hands. So this is a very important one. So that is an, a good example. And some ways that we've been using that then, Adrian, in the, the maybe past 12 months and even more, Previous to that as well, we've gone different exercise and different ways to do that. 
in a bid to have a big focus on distance and interplay here's an exercise that we've been using very simple the kick shield cannot leave the body so that means the person has to use their footwork and their their distance play to interact other side their job is to use their front leg almost like building a wall and to be able to use that and attack and defense different setups different timing different rhythms and being able to defend with that effectively then against an oncoming opponent so this would be very like step one of solving this problem and building the skills necessary and then eventually building this up towards live sparring with some more advanced skills coming along the way yeah absolutely and you know we you, you kind of need both sides to work on that and, and, and in this case you know you have mm-hmm. uh one person offering a good psychic that's going to give you a challenge as a an attacker with the blitz and uh, so in in this case in terms of dealing with the hands we're, we're looking at the psychic as a defensive option but you you know you need to have the the movement then in terms of the attacker to be able to deal with that psychic so we can train that just in terms of being in and out of range and developing a little bit of sensitivity to it and exercises we've done kind of like this staying in a straight line giving a person an incentive to extend the leg onto the target and giving the opposite person the incentive of having that leg miss or you know come up a bit short and be constrained you know these are kind of things that we would look to do and then for me as we were kind of going towards the hands we kind of went with the idea and i'll pop back up that visual that we kind of go back to again and again in terms of the setting up the constraints um would often limit so the, the the goal in this is always to try and get people doing something that's a little bit more representative to how it's going to be inspiring and create a situation where the decisions are going to and the solutions to the problems are going to emerge quite naturally um mm-hmm. In terms of what we've been doing, getting the, the hands working as a defense, we've been focusing on the position of the body versus the opponent's body um, and uh, looking at getting the body off that straight line. And then let's see if we can integrate the hands a little bit with that. So whether that is slipping the head to the side as you punch the body with the back hand, whether that's a slip hook pivoting the back foot out of the way or a fade away back fist like we had from Manus Trickery last week where you're looking to jump away and catch the person with your front hand basically increasing the distance you know it all of those we can encourage to develop by saying hey here's what we're going to do your job is to defend the blitz the other person is going to create the blitz but let's see how successful it is if you can go at full speed and if we do that and the attacking person is at full speed and they're too successful well all right now let's see if you can do that only by jumping or only with your two hands together or only using your front, you know, and we can manipulate that a little bit, put them on their off side and see how that goes. And then if the defensive side is too successful, we can bring a little bit of something in, into play as well to uh, allow the other person to shorten the distance, to uh, to have a split rhythm. Uh, and by doing that, we're kind of creating a situation where we're solving the problem over and over again. But it's still like, that's where we start. And that's where we spent mm. quite a bit of time actually last year, respect for the majority of the students. And then you've got to go a little further because you're not only going to be blitzed. So there needs to be other options available. You know, the, uh, the person who's throwing the blitz needs to have a little bit more freedom to bring the front leg in to, you know, uh, to maybe do something if they connect with the blitz. And that's kind of where, you know, I'm looking at the start of this year going, well, OK, most people are quite comfortable if they know it's a blitz coming. We're good there. Now, how do we deal with this where the blitz is, you know, part of the problem that's being presented, Mm -hmm. but we need to see those distinguishing features. We need to be able to identify whether the person is going to be coming with hands or or foot. Yeah, the big thing for me here in all of this is the interplay. And that's the the beauty of it because there's attack and defense or there's action and reaction, whatever way you want to look at it. Because what's to say you don't train these solutions that we've listed out for a blitz whether it's defensive side kick uh, straight line back kick the jump away back fist why don't you just drill these against the the oncoming opponent of a blitz but it's the interplay that's so important and we see even in the clips we just looked at the the switching of distance the the in and out action it's it's these moments that you have to be able to train to react to and to be able to work with so it's that interplay between you and a live opponent which is so key because it's it's these micro switches the the technique itself and the solution is only part of the equation it's picking the right moment picking the right distance 
picking the correct shot for the correct moment and all these things. Yeah. And this only comes through that interplay. So that that's why we, we do it this way, as opposed to just training the technique solution in isolation by itself. So it needs to be uh, something that's brought into the whole game of a dynamic interaction between two people, because that's what sparring is at the end of the day. Yeah, that brings you to something we're just talking about, maybe the threatening front leg. And, you know, this has been a thing for a very, very long time in ITF, that if you have uh, the capacity to cover distance and threaten multiple heights and, we say, both sides of the head, you know, with yeah. the front leg, you have a question that just has to be answered. So you're very much stat checking your opponent. You're saying, hey, have you got a capacity to deal with this problem that we're giving you? And if the answer is no, cool, I win. And we've seen yeah. so many competitors over the years who really don't need to step beyond that too often. And, you know, that's for me is always on the, like the, the checklist of things to do. Um, now, it's not one of your solid from cards. Yeah, exactly. But you'll tend to look at it and go, oh, look, you're flexible and you, you know, we can build some strength in there and carry it. But I spent most of last year when I looked at my students, we came back after COVID. It was the first kind of really consistent block of training once we got back into September through to December and it kind of felt like okay we've dropped in capacity here the flexibility was gone it wasn't as good as it had been I mean mm -hmm. generally some people retained it very well and improved in fact some people did fall off so it was like okay this is where we need to step it back a little bit and address capacity so you can't really work on having that threatening front leg if you haven't got the flexibility or the 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 uh, the ability to push off and cover distance and they're linked you know you need to build the capacity first so we did spend a good part of the last three four months working on capacity building around mobility and hip strength in a, in order to be able to deliver that shot and i'm looking forward to for a lot of people being able to start to integrate integrate that as a constraint where we can challenge people to you know to create that pressure off the front leg yeah, that's an important point because you might see something that your favorite fighter does, but the physical abilities that they have or even their 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 body in comparison to yours is completely different. So you have to keep that in context as well that you can't do absolutely everything that everybody else can do and vice versa. So it's about playing to your strengths as well and getting the maximum value you can for your style. So that's very important. And having a solid sidekick is very important, but a lot of good fighters have a great solid sidekick without having crazy flexibility and then once you have that you can you can again get back to this interplay where one side is very simply trying to get past your front leg where you have to keep it a good threat and vary the distance vary the length of the sidekick and be able to use it in isolation just with one technique to defend yourself and look after yourself against somebody who's trying to get the hands and that there we go again with the interplay because it it goes back to the the first main topic we looked at of dealing with somebody with solid hands so if you can deal with that on both ends you're then solving two big problems so that's the beauty of that as well that you get to play as an attacker and a defender let's say if it was a field sport yeah absolutely and you know i think that's a huge part of sparring is that uh, not everybody is as comfortable in every part of the game so maybe you don't have that big front leg shot but you're quite capable of, you know, preserving distance, creating pressure, defending yourself with that front leg, but maybe not getting that direct to the head, you know, big score, the, the big direct hacks or, you know, blindside dodeo or whatever it happens to be. That's a big score direct off the front leg. But it doesn't mean your front leg can't be effective and can't be mm -hmm. used to your advantage. Um, someone else. And typically, if someone has that safety net of I can do, you know, draw shapes in the sky with my front leg. Very often, those people don't blitz very well because they don't usually have to go to hands yeah so we can find sometimes that you know fighters are really exceptional in terms of what they do with their front leg but they become fixed sideways and mm -hmm. monodirectional so you know this is something that yeah it's a problem you have to solve and a problem you'd like to create but you don't want to create the problem so well that you've limited the fighter to one style of play and yeah. because that eventually you'll, you'll find that clever opponent who goes oh okay but i have a solution for that and you know, and life becomes a bit more difficult. Yeah, with, with the front leg, is it, for it to be a threat, it has to have some versatility with it as well. You have to be able to shoot body and head and different angles as well. If your psychic is 
constant and the same all the time. Like you just said, once somebody gets a read on that, it's then going to become very easy for them. So you need to be able to change the distance you attack from, the length of the leg, the varied, even the the angle of the shot. You might go from side kick to maybe even a turning kick or a hook kick, depending on what you want. So that's another big factor of having a threatening version of a front leg. So it's not just side kick. It, it's a versatility of many techniques off that front leg. Then I think the next thing I was looking at, and it's an always thing as well, is this idea of how do you maximize the value of your scores? So in other words, it's really hard, you know, sometimes to get into contact. So if you're going to get into contact, how do you make sure you're coming out of that contact with more of the points than your opponent? Yeah, and we see Greg Lepere from Jubeck and Neil Ernest, an old one from 2007. But you see, once they get the contact, the board of the guys are very keen to get as many points on the board for themselves as they can while trying to keep solid as well and, and not give away any shots and concede anything from their own point of view. Um, and we've seen this year especially has been a big combination of gaining momentum on the front foot with hands, getting somebody yeah. to come back, and then setting up that big turning kick to the head and maximizing there with, with your entry on the hands, usually a point or two, and then a big three pointer to finish, you know? So you're looking at a potentially a five point score there. And, that, and that's the difference then at the end of the day between the, the scoring, the single shots and the maximizing of the scores. And that's what we've seen, especially when the going gets tough quarterfinal, semifinal, final stage, that seems to be a big difference maker um, yeah. for the guys that are, that are winning at all divisions. And I mean, I definitely have seen this as more of a an attitude and application kind of thing than a like a skill development kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, it's often starting with the mindset that you are going to go and continue. You're going to continue to apply that pressure. You're going to look for that score. You're not going to try to get in, get out, because that's the opposite. That's it has its place, and clean, clear scores have absolutely have their place. But if we're going to build momentum, we have to be able to follow through and create movement. And, mm-hmm. you know, some of the things that we've played with are things like forcing the follow on. So if that if you ha- if you do throw the front leg or if you throw your side kick, you have to make an attempt to follow on. And it means you can't throw for nothing. You're throwing the shot with the intention of creating movement from your opponent, reading the movement, figuring out your best follow on. Uh, you know, and here we can see a couple of the guys playing with it back in the summer camp. Um, we've given the uh, the opposite person, so the person closest to camera at the moment is backhand and back kick, just to give him some natural counters to the follow on, um, and to give him an opportunity to read the side kick and do something with it. But uh, it, we're, we're really trying I mean, to create that challenge. And of course, the the most important thing about that as well, Adrian, is that stops the person who's looking for the side kick, which is on the left of the camera here, Finn from just throwing aimless shots that aren't realistic. So we, we call that keeping the opponent honest. So the fact yeah. that he has good, solid counters for that, it keeps the person who's attacking from not just launching in from crazy distances, which are incorrect. So he has to set it up. He has to be clever, and he has to pick the right moments to go. And then he does a great job here of finding that big score we talked about, the big continuation with the high turning kick after hands. Yeah, and I mean, it's a huge thing as well to... You know to know your opponent isn't going to stop so in other words avoiding the sidekick doesn't get you out of trouble there is yeah. going to be more so it encourages you as well to deal with the sidekick at the first time of asking so when the leg is lifting there's an opportunity to step through there and put the backhand onto it uh but if you miss that opportunity then you're having to create an angle you're going to try and find a moment to catch the person as they drop their front leg there's again that interplay we speak of where yeah what we're really working on here what we were hoping to start with there was let's get the person following their front leg and looking to maximize their advantage but the thing is if they do it sloppily they're going to be caught caught by the backhand if there's too big a gap or it's too obvious when the leg is dropping and the next shot is coming there's a back kick waiting for them there as well so you know it's that kind of thing of giving enough of an incentive to both people where it feels like and plays like an even game uh but you always want this skill that you're working on to be successful a little bit more often. So like 55, 60% of the time, just so that there's a feeling that that skill is developing. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing you say there as well is because when you're now thinking of what comes next, you're naturally thinking of that mindset that you said earlier is the key to the skill. 
to be able yeah. to, to have that mindset initially of what comes next. You're not just focused on the single entry. You're thinking about the third, the fourth, and what comes after those initial entry shots to get you in, whether it's the side kick, followed by hands, followed by turning kick. You're not just single-minded with it. Um, as well, it, it's I think it's worth mentioning here because we might take this for granted, but how does this become a thing in part of our training? It's incentivizing people to do it based on the rule set of sparring so although it looks like free sparring the rule set is you must do a certain action if not there may be a punishment or if you do there might maybe an incentive and maybe that's like you have to do an exercise maybe there's a punishment if you don't do something so that's how we kind of like we come up with the solutions to get these across and because sometimes it can be hard if you just say okay you have this you have this because then Maybe there's not enough incentive for for each side to go about what they want to do. So there is a gameplay with all these as well. Whereas scores, whether it's an exercise you have to do if if you if you don't do what you're meant to, etc. So there's there's always an incentive to get the skill or to practice the the solution that we want to come up time and time again. Absolutely. So moving into our last topic for today. Um... And I think for me, this this pushing of the tempo kind of really came to the fore in when I was watching the World Cup. You had those three minute rounds, and uh, uh, we have an example here with Jamie and uh, Axel, and um, just different ways that you can do it. But the reason that that kind of came to me from the World Cup was looking at uh, the Slovenians in particular, and um, also the likes of uh, some of the Spanish, uh, Yasin as, as as another example. Uh, and in moments from uh, uh, a couple of the Argentinian competitors, particularly uh, Bustamante and uh, uh, and so on, where there's it's not that the whole match is at a high tempo, yeah. But at critical moments, after a warning has been given, after they've gone behind or they've just gone ahead, um, after a restart, they've been able to kind of just go, you know, skip third, go straight to fourth, and put a bit of pressure on. And sustain the pressure for a little bit and what we really mean by this is you're not you're, you're starting to raise yet yeah, the, the intensity of the fight if you like but it's also that you're not letting your opponent determine any of the movement there you're, you're forcing them to react to the pacing the distances you're keeping them on the back foot slightly keeping some pressure on consistently so that they feel that pressure you know uh as you change the tempo and that's definitely yeah. be something uh, or being something that uh, will we have worked a little bit on we're going to continue to work on over the next little while yeah definitely it's about being the boss at certain times and critical times of the output and uh, the volume that you put out i think i think that's like here's a good example of an exercise where both people are just using a tapping drill and then once there's a signal somebody is trying to outwork and outperform the other person in terms of output and volume and i think that like if, if you look at these fighters that you mentioned earlier like if you, if you did a bit of analysis on the stats there on the, the amount of shots they throw compared to their opponent these other fighters have a very very high output and i think that that's where they yeah. bring their tempo from and then naturally like if, if you can do it well there's way more chance that you're going to get scores on the board if you have that higher output yeah, and I mean, for the likes of this exercise, we often take out side kick or back kick, you know, so there's no direct stop. And that, you know, the, the, the reason is that you're looking for people to be able to continue and find shots that flow one into, into another. And and that's very often the thing is, you know, we're looking to create that flow, what shot links to the next shot in order to maintain it. And we're looking for splits of rhythm and changes of angles so that you can kind of get in, find a slight angle so your opponent doesn't get to just stop you on the line. And then you're back in again. Um, but again, this is play. And, you know, we keep coming back to this again and again and again, that the first step is we'll try an idea. Okay, you get to do this, you get to do this, we're leaving this part out, we'll go for X amount of seconds. The whole rolling start idea was an experiment that we tried variations of. So it could start in something like a tapping exercise. It could start in the recovery phase. So someone might do a high hook kick and go foot to foot recovery. But once they've made contact with the opponent, the match starts. It could begin with the first forward action from competitors. So they're relaxed and they're moving. And the first forward action gives you your rolling start. 
And we just brought that in as an idea that so much of drill in particular, and even some of the constraint stuff that we do starts with what we'd call an equal position on the floor. It starts from the point where both people are bouncing in the middle of the ring with the whole every option available to them. And we wanted to move into a place where actually you've got forward momentum already. Actually, you've, you're, you're, you know, you're retreating already or you're moving towards the edge of the ring or to the corner of the ring or you've just been moving left and you change and go right. And by do or, or even like we had in this one, we are in contact. And the goal is to, you know, to be the one who can step it up and change it from there, but to be react, react, reacting from an unusual circumstance or something that's not as easily trained for. Yeah, it's like it, it, it's not kind of in your comfort zone, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. But like you made a good point there because we train a lot of time from that static position where maybe a match starts at round one or round two in the center of the ring where both, both for both parties, let's say it's equal playing field where I would imagine 90% of scoring opportunities in ITF sparring comes from that interplay where somebody's on the back foot, somebody's on the front foot, and there's an interaction there that, that that's happening at a different part of the ring. It's very, like, very uncommon for just a blind score to come out of open space in the center of ring. Now, it happens if somebody's really, really quick, yeah. but it's usually the scores come from that interaction and that, that dynamic interplay of multiple techniques, inflow in combination with another person trying to hit you back as well which always makes it more difficult well absolutely and so i suppose the thing as we go forward into this next year uh i'm really thinking about how do i address the problems that i've seen the the decision points that i've seen really not so much problems because anything that's a problem is also an opportunity if you can do it so mm-hmm. you know you're looking at hey what's been successful for people what's been uh, presenting itself as a challenge for my competitors what have my competitors been doing that's actually been a challenge for my opponent or for their opponents and then how do we set up those decision points to come up again and again and again in our training so that we get better going back to your Pareto principle at the 20 percent of what you know what are the 20 percent of inputs that are going to be most valuable and we want to really dial in there so rather than trying to give that one person a back kick that they just don't really seem to have an affinity for or the timing for, mm-hmm. well, let's see if we can really improve their defensive sidekick so they have a solution in the same family and, and work off of that. But this approach lets us say, hey, you can take a defensive shot. It doesn't have to be the back kick. We're not drilling back kick today. We have a problem. It's a blitz. And we yeah. need you to solve that problem. It could Whatever be that it's a back maybe. kick. It could be defensive side kick. You could slip the body. You could have a retreat back fist. So because that's what it is, we're we're trying to solve problems and we're trying to create problems for our opponents. And there's no rule that says you have to do it with this technique unless we make it that way. Yeah, many many ways to skin a cat, as they say. But yeah, like what we talk about here today is well. well applies more if you can compete often because these are the moments where we have an opportunity to test what we've been working on to find out yeah. if it works if it doesn't work where we lack you go back to that SWOT analysis at the start so you also need to compete frequently enough to test your skills because sometimes it can be easy in training but also then to have a little bit of analysis get somebody to record your matches sit down watch them what's working well what's not working what are the solutions and problems you weren't ready for and then that's where you kind of dial in your training going forward again four things that we mentioned today are four things that we see time and time again overall across the board that if you can get good at these will have your game 80 percent of the way there and then you can just kind of fine tune the the other things so i suppose for us we're uh we're in norway uh so for the weekend we're being hosted quite uh uh, it's going to be very exciting. We're with uh, uh, Roy Rolstedt in, in Norway and Oslo, and it gives us an opportunity to try, uh, I suppose, to see with a whole new group of people what, uh, what their experience of training did, mm. you know, in this manner is. And it should give an awful lot of questions for us to answer, and it should hopefully give us some, some more examples that we can share with everybody else uh, in terms of, you know, how this works for people who've never encountered this style of training before, or maybe only in a limited sense or what they've taken from the videos or in their own interpretation of it. So it's going to be really interesting. I'm looking forward to it quite a lot. 
yeah it's gonna it's gonna be great and hopefully we'll get some clips there as well and share some of these ideas we'll be bringing some of the ideas we just spoke about today to the seminar as well hopefully we'll be able to kind of expand on some of those and solve problems for people at the seminar that's something that we also are very excited about like we spoke today about looking at your own performance and what do you do if there's a technique you want to include or there's a, a solution that you need in your game but you don't know how to approach it so we hope to be able to answer those questions for people specifically at the, the camp and hopefully get some value for some people to improve their game. Excellent. All right. Well, that's it for this week. And we'll see everyone next Friday. And as I said, hopefully we'll have a time to decompress and put together all the ideas that we've kind of come up with from working on that camp. And we can share them with the rest of you for next week. That's it. See you again. We'll see you in the next one.